Welcome to this CME activity, Innovations in Insulin, New Opportunities to Individualize Therapy. Now, let's join our distinguished faculty, Dr. Vivian Fonseca and Dr. Jonathan Leffert. Hello, welcome to this program on Innovations in Insulin, New Opportunities to Individualize Therapy. My name is Vivian Fonseca. I'm professor of medicine at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And joining me today is Dr. Jonathan Leffert, who is an endocrinologist in Dallas, Texas, and the current president of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. So we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which is a complex disease, the, a major characteristic of which is decline in beta cell function. And this is present at the time of diagnosis. And with many of the therapies that we have, the disease continues to progress in terms of beta cell function to the point where after many years of type 2 diabetes, you almost like type 1 with very little uh, function of the beta cell with quite a substantial insulin deficiency requiring replacement in, in insulin. The other characteristic of diabetes is the long-term complications, which are related to damage caused by glucose being high. And this is uh, called glycemic exposure. Uh, it consists of uh, some exposure in the fasting state, as well as very substantial exposure uh, of the tissues to high blood glucose after meals. And it's the net exposure of glucose, this hyperglycemia that's damaging tissues and uh, when we look at it from a treatment perspective, we talk about controlling it in the basal state, which essentially is the pre-meal and fasting state, as well as the mealtime hyperglycemia. And both are important components as we will discuss. Now, Jonathan, we, we often, we look at glucose and we look at A1C, and there are a number of goals and people get a little confused about what these goals should be, so could you uh, update us on where we are with this? Certainly, Vivian. Thank you. We have the ADA goal for A1C, which is less than 7%, and the AACE goal, which is less than 6.5%. Fasting blood sugar should usually be in the 80 to 130 range or thereabouts, and postprandial blood sugar should be less than 180, according to the ADA, and less than 140, according to ACE. This all results in excellent glycemic control, which decreases the overall complications of diabetes. But sorry to interrupt, but the goals are actually not that diff very far apart because the, both organizations uh, ed emphasize individualization of goals. And, yes, and, and that's really the most important thing is that as, an, as a practicing clinical endocrinologist, we daily have to deal with individuals and specific goals related to their uh, problems, and they all have different issues related to age and life expectancy, other comorbid conditions that are associated with their disease. And we always are concerned about balancing the idea of good glycemic control against the concerns of hypoglycemia. And other side effects as well. Yes. This, this is uh, interesting in the sense that we have to always have an idea of how we're going about taking care of our patients. And there's an algorithm that is uh, yearly put out by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which goes through how we decide what is, are going to be our next steps in treatment. And as far as insulin is concerned, insulin can come anywhere along the pathway. It's important sometimes to give insulin early on when patients are very ill and they have other problems which require it. And then there are also times when we start with oral agents and progress to insulin. So patients who, dis who are started on insulin are of the usual type, which would be hyperglycemic emergencies. Those are patients who are usually in the hospital. Hyperglycemia with very high A1Cs. If they have hepatic or renal disease and can't take other medications, certainly patients who have increased coronary, have coronary disease with high triglyceride levels. And then we always need to go to insulin when we can't get control with other combinations of oral or injectable agents, or we have side effects of those oral and injectable agents. 
Sometimes patients want more flexibility, so we put them on insulin. And then there are a number of special circum circumstances. A common thing that happens in the office is that patients call and say, uh, I just got placed on steroids for some other cause, and we have to use insulin in those cases. So, you know, we, insulin works very well, uh, as, as you discussed. Uh, for, you use it in emergencies, but there are a lot of people who still don't get to go with their, despite taking insulin. We've got very used to titrating insulin. Uh, there are a number of studies that have looked at forced titration based on some algorithms that are predetermined in protocols that very often we translate into practice. We've actually also started teaching patients to do their own titration. Uh, if you look at the studies involved, they take people with very poorly controlled diabetes and get their mean A1C down very close to around 7%, which is not bad considering that they start well above 8 But that means half the people are not really getting to go uh, on A1C. Now, you also mentioned goals for individual glucose very often. Uh, when you're using basal insulin, that's the fasting glucose, and we, we're not fully addressing uh, all the things that go with A1C. Having said that, I, I want to emphasize the importance of titrating, titrating in, in appropriately to get to the goal that you've set for your patient for fasting glucose. While avoiding hypoglycemia, you may need to back titrate sometimes if your patient gets hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia is actually quite common in these so-called treat-to-target studies. There have been analyses done of uh, pooled data from multiple treat-to-target uh, studies. One st uh, particular study looked at over 2,000 patients over a six-week uh, period of time and found that a lot of people had hypoglycemia. Very often it's uh, mild symptoms, but sometimes it can be uh, fairly severe hypoglycemia, needing assistance of somebody else, or they've documented a blood glucose themselves, some, Below the ADA now defines it as below 54, but patients have recorded below 50. And they get very frustrated and scared of this kind of uh, situation. And very often, it leads to lack of compliance. It also has implications for uh, cardiovascular events and, and other heart events. So while we focus on fasting glucose with uh, basal insulin, uh, uh, we also need to think about A1C as having multiple components. So could you tell us a little bit more, Jonathan, about you know, is, uh, what is A1C and when, is, when should we start thinking about postprandial glucose? So thanks, Vivian. I think that it's very important to make sure that we always recognize that A1C is a part of both a, a, a pre- and postprandial blood sugar control. And there's been multiple studies that have looked at that. And it's important to always think if you're not getting control of, of the diabetes with a basal insulin, that a prandial insulin, insulin may be required to get postprandial control of the blood sugar. So that's a that's very crucial component of what we're doing in the overall aspect of taking care of patients with type 2 diabetes. So there are also other reasons why you would want to make sure that you are taking care of the postprandial blood sugars. And that, that is that postprandial hyperglycemia independently predicts cardiovascular risk. And there's a number of different studies that have looked at this issue. And it turns out that many of these postprandial blood sugars are, have increased risk of coronary disease, all-cause mortality increased with a number of these studies. And so it's, very, it's, a, it's a crucial component of our overall management cardiovascular risk being the major, uh, ish, major uh, component of mortality and morbidity for patients with type 2 diabetes. So Vivian, can you talk about how we target the hyperglycemia and how that reduces the cardiovascular risk? So we, we have done a number of studies targeting postprandial hyperglycemia, and the aims of these studies were different. You know, some of them are uh, with the, there's a study with ACABOS, for example, that uh, was a diabetes prevention study, another one called Navigator that used nitaglinide. There we were looking mainly at prevention of progression to diabetes, the progression of the disease that we talked about earlier, but also uh, looked at, uh, at cardiovascular events. 
And they were a little disappointing. There was some suggestion of a benefit with acabose, uh, no benefit with nitaglinide. There was another study done with insulin where they compared using Lyspro to target postprandial or uh, using glargine or NPH to target fasting glucose. And, and this, this was done in patients with, uh, with heart disease. The study was called HEART2D. And it showed no difference. And I think part of the problem in that study is they chose either postprandial or basal. And I think you've got to target both. Uh, you know, you mentioned how you, you've got to identify patients who have a problem with basal. I, one little nuance there is that if you have people whose A1C is above gold, yet their fasting glucose is not bad. And very often these are people who have mild elevations in A1C. If your A1C is 10, it doesn't matter what insulin you use. But when if you're using basal insulin and your A1C is around 7.5 or so, very often postprandial hypoglycemia is an important component in that. And, and we need to address that. So uh, we need to think about all these things when we are managing our patients who are not at the goals that we have set them. Right